I want to talk to you about faith. It's one of the most important things in the Bible. And some people have had confusion about what faith is. Go to Mark 11, please. Verse 22. Jesus cursed the fig tree. And this is, let's pick it up in 20. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Jesus had said, let's pick it up in verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, Jesus was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So you see Jesus, and he's going to the fig tree, and he finds nothing on it but leaves. And then he's going to curse it when it says it's not the season for the figs. That doesn't seem fair, does it? But what you have to understand is when the leaves appear on the fig tree, we had a neighbor down the street, she had a fig tree. We we're always eating those figs. But when the leaves appear, the little bud of the fig tree, the little bud of the figs appears too. So what was happening here was that there was no bud. There was no bud of fruit. There were just leaves. And so it was a, uh, a tree that was taking up room and wasn't going to produce anything. And that's why Jesus cursed it. Not that he's out to just curse trees, but this was a non-productive tree. It wasn't producing. So now let's go to verse 20. And so when they came in the morning, back in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. What this tells us is there's a God kind of faith. There's a God kind of faith. It's much higher than natural faith. We all operate in natural faith. I came in here and I sat down at that pew because I have natural faith. I know it's going to hold me up. We have natural faith that we will use in the natural realm. And that's proper and that's the way it should be. But then there's a higher level of faith and it's called the God kind of faith. And this is the kind of faith that we have to learn how to operate in. If you really want to be successful in life, if you want to go high in God, if you want to accomplish things, if you want to do exploits for God, you have to learn how to operate in the God kind of faith. Natural faith is only good in the natural realm. But if we want to do exploits in the supernatural realm, then we have to operate in the God kind of faith. So what is the God kind of faith? We will see, and I don't want to deal with this right now, but we will see because of Mark 23 that the God kind of faith has everything to do with declaring. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. This is one reason why we guard our mouths. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are a lot of things that you and I can say that will tear down our faith. I bypass a zillion things that I never say because I know it won't be productive for my own ears to hear it because then I can't operate in faith. We all bypass many things we'd like to say, negative things, critical things, judgmental things, hateful things, wrong things. A lot of times we have coming out of our spirits, out of our heart, things we would like to say, maybe things to get even. This is what I should say to get even. Or this is what I should say, he cut me down, I'll say this to cut him down. Many opportunities we have to speak out of our mouths in non-productive speech in hateful speech, in irritated speech. 
the more we allow, allow our mouths to speak in non-productive speech, negative talk, the less effective we will be in the spiritual realm. Because if I don't say something, it's wrong, it's critical, it's judgmental, and I don't say it, I retain, I retain it, and I let it die unborn, then my own ears don't perceive it, and it goes nowhere in the spirit. But if I allow myself to just say anything and everything and just, you know, chatty Kathy, just this comment about that, all negative, all critical, all judgmental or whatever, then when I really want to use my voice to rebuke the devil, when I really want to use my voice to move a mountain, I don't have any confidence in my voice. I have no power in my voice because I've spoken so much garbage, ineffectual, en français, inutile speech, speech that isn't utilized, isn't useful for anything. So the first thing we have to do if you want God kind of faith is to watch your mouth. You don't let just everything dribble out of your mouth, garbage just dribble out of your mouth, because then you will go to have to have power, real power. You've got to turn something. I cannot tell you over the years how many countless times God has said, here's the problem. And he's told us whatever the problem is. Let's say for a person. Let's say for a city. Let's say for whatever. And he said to us, Pastor Stephanie and I, now I want you to turn it. Oh, thanks a lot, God. Who am I? So you learn quickly to use your mouth for power and not for garbage. Because if you do say any manner of thing out of your mouth, then when you have to have power to turn something, you don't have any power. Your own heart doesn't believe you anymore. Your heart says, oh, she just says anything. I'm not going to get behind this. Your head and your heart, I'm talking about heart as in spirit, your head and your heart, your spirit, have to be in agreement. Now, there are sometimes our head just goes tilt. Like, this is too big for me to comprehend that God would say to me, I have to do this or that. Let's say God said to me when I lived in Tulsa, you have to go home to Portland, Oregon, and build me a church. My head went, exit. My spirit grabbed a hold of it. My heart didn't want it. My heart no more wanted to come back to this place than anything in the world. In fact, I cried for four years over it. But my spirit man said, we're going to do it. So I realized that I couldn't speak negativity out of my mouth. I couldn't say anything against the plan of God. I... There were parts of my being that weren't in agreement with God. But my spirit man was mature enough to understand, you get in agreement with God whether you like it or not. And don't say one word against the plan of God, or you will cut off your power, you will cut off your ability to perform the will of God. So you will be presented with negative things, so will I like a husband who's had a stroke, or a wife who's got disabilities, whatever it is, and your spirit will say, this is possible with God to raise this man back up to the newness of life. Or you'll have a loved one who's not saved, going to hell, and parts of your being will say, I can't do this, this is bigger than I am. Can we get this settled? Everything with us is impossible, but everything with God is possible. So what we do is we lean more into God when we're faced with an impossibility. And we guard our mouths and we guard our heart. We don't allow our heart to criticize the plan of God. We shut our heart off from misgivings. Oh no, this is going to happen. Well, that'll happen. You know, Satan all day long 
will show us these movie pictures about what's going to happen. Just remember, please remember this fact. Satan is the father of lies. Lies. He can't tell the truth. He's never told the truth, not once. So when your mind goes tilt, even when your human heart goes tilt, who am I? I can't do this plan of God. You're right about that. You can't. Neither can I. None of us can do the plan of God, but guess who can do the plan of God? The Holy Spirit who lives within us can do the plan of God. My endeavor in my life is just to stay out of his way and let him to perform what he wants to. Let him have his way. Have him do his plan. I just try to shut my mouth spiritually, not jabber a lot. Oh, how is this going to happen? How are we going to do this? This can't be done. This is impossible. I try to keep all that stuff quiet within my being. I don't say those things. I don't let them out into the atmosphere because there is a spirit in the atmosphere, the prince of the power of the air, that once I speak it, he will try to bring all those thoughts, all those random negative critical things that I say to pass. Don't give him any fodder. Don't give him any weapons to use against you. Innumerable times, you and I could have said negative things when God told us to go do something. We could have said the negative. I can't do that. Now, you can say this to God privately. I say this all the time. I can't do life. You're going to have to do life through me. I cannot do life by myself. That's a biblical truth. But you don't get out in the atmosphere negative talk, self-talk against yourself. You simply don't do it. Have you ever tried to compliment a person, tell them uh, words of affirmation about a gift you see within them, and they say, well, I don't know about that, and they wipe away your, your beautiful praise that's a godly praise, your affirmation of them, they wipe it away. Oh, I don't know about that. You know, I'm blah, blah, blah. And then they downgrade themselves. Has this ever happened to you? It happens to me, and it frustrates the tar out of me. Because when God shows me something about a person in Christ, something good about them, it's right to bring that to that person's attention. People need to be built up, not torn down. They need to know what's in them that's good. So you keep your mouth quiet about the bad things about yourself. Because you can run yourself down. Hey, we're real good at that, aren't we? But actually, we need to hear from the Spirit of God the good things about ourselves, And to speak that. The devil will use anything he can to get a hold of the plan of God and rip it right out of your hands. That's why you never speak against the plan of God for your life. You never say one negative thing because you're giving him ammunition. The God kind of faith says what God says. You search the Bible to find out what in the word of God is approving of you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're redeemed. You're the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. These are the things you always proclaim because then your ears, your own ears hear that and your ear and your heart believes that because your spirit and your heart are now in alignment. Now go to Hebrews 11. We are, we must know what the God kind of faith is and we must delve into it because we all have natural faith that, I'm sorry, that's only good for the natural. We have to have supernatural faith. Every person in this room has to grow up into the supernatural faith of God. One of the ways we do that is Mark 11:23. We say three times as much saying. Well, let's go back there for just a moment. Mark 11:23.
This is Jesus talking. It's in red. Assuredly, for assuredly, that means I swear to you. I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, that's one says, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. You can doubt in your head. You just can't doubt in your heart. And does not doubt in in his heart, but believes that those things he says two times, saying, will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. You have to do three times as much proclaiming and saying and declaring and decreeing as you do believing in your heart. The heart is only mentioned once. And if your mouth starts decreeing something and your heart doesn't believe it, now it means you need more time meditating on the word to get the word in your heart so your heart and your mouth will agree with one another. Jesus is the one who said it takes three times as much proclaiming, declaring your faith, declaring, like let's say God's going to say to you, um, let's say he says, I want you to have a new car. Then you find scriptures that promise you a new car. Whatever it is. And you start proclaiming those scriptures. And you get your heart so full of the word of God in belief that you can have that heart's desires that your heart and your words now are in complete alignment. Now you've got the God kind of faith. God believed in his heart. He proclaimed with his mouth and he created the whole universe, including us. You've got to get your heart and your mouth in alignment. When your mouth doesn't do its job, by proclaiming the word of God for whatever it is you want, you disqualify and hurt your own heart because your heart listens to that and then like a little arrow of unbelief comes into your heart. And you say, oh, that's right, I can't have that because your mouth just declared something negative. I shall never forget 1990 perhaps. Pastor Stephanie and I were invited to Finland to hold a conference on the island of Olan. And we had to go to Finland and then we had to take a ferry across to Olan. And that trip was amazing. (laughs) It was dangerous. Before we left, We were all praying. Learn out to pray out the things that God promises you. If God promises you marriage, you better pray it all out. You better pray every facet of it out. If he tells you that he's going to give you a new job, a better job, you better pray it all out. You better get it all prayed out so that you can walk into it with ease. If you don't pray out and declare out what God has shown you, you will have a hard time walking it out. You don't pray it out, you have a hard time walking it out. So God spoke to us that we were to go to this, to, to hold this conference. That was God's idea. That was God's plan. It wasn't my plan. We wanted to go because we are Swedish, Finnish, and Norwegian, and we wanted to go to our homeland. But when in deep prayer then, God spoke to us and said, split dangerous crossing. The Holy Spirit said two things. Split, dangerous crossing. Now I hear dangerous crossing and I want to cancel the trip. I mean, what do I need to put my life in jeopardy for? But you have to get into the God kind of faith. The God kind of faith says, I heard the Holy Spirit give me his plan. Give me God's plan. And now, come hell or high water, I have to achieve that plan. This is what a faithful servant does. It doesn't matter if there's danger. You have to pray through on that plan. You have to pray through on what the Holy Spirit has told you so that you can access and perform God's plan. And the Holy Spirit will warn you if there's danger. And believe me, in ministry there's danger. Very often there's danger. We've had danger on flights, danger on ships, Danger, just like, well, not just like the Apostle Paul. Absolutely, he had a lot of danger. But he had to perform the perfect will of God, and so do you. 
So when you pray ahead of time out the plan, you make, you, let's say that he tells you something that it, you just can't e even believe. It's too big. It's huge. It's a mountain standing before you. It's a mountain. Maybe it's your healing. Maybe it's the healing of your spouse. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe you're supposed to start a company. Whatever it is, you're supposed to be the greatest evangelist in Portland. You hear the Holy Spirit clearly. Now what do you do? You start praying it out. You pray out the mystery of that plan. You get on your face before God. You get on walks, whatever, however you pray the best. You start praying out the plan of God before you get there. Because I, I will assure you, if you don't pray out the plan of God, it will be very difficult to walk out the plan of God. You're going to meet roadblocks. You're going to meet mountains. All manner of things will you encounter unless you pray out that plan. But to enter into the God kind of faith, you have to be an obedient servant and you have to go do what he said. Maybe he's told you you're going to be one of the finest pastor teachers in the land, but you've got every obstacle facing you. So you start praying and then the Holy Spirit will direct you. Just like he did for us, we were invited to this conference to do this conference one week. But now we hear that it's a dangerous crossing. We hear split. I don't know what split means. Neither one of us knew what split meant. So we start praying and we pray and we pray. You pray till you get a note of victory. You pray until you see the mountain dwindling. You pray until you feel in the spirit, you might not see them with your eyes, until you see circumstances changing. It's up to you to pray through the plan of God. He's told you what the plan is. Your spouse will be healed. You're going to start a new company. You must be married. Whatever it is. But there are so many obstacles. If you're in natural faith, you'll believe all the obstacles and you'll leave the plan of God and say, that's too hard. I can't do that. That's the whole point. We can't do the plan of God. The only one who can do the plan of God is the Holy Spirit. And he's more than capable to get you and I into the perfect will of God and to walk out that perfect plan. So we begin to pray. And we prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, we lived in a huge house out in East County. I had the master bedroom and it had this huge, huge floor with balconies. And so we'd get several ladies, about five. At one time we had five twin friends and we were all prayers. And so we would get down on the floor on our faces and we would pray about this trip. It's a good thing we did. So when we, we flew to Finland, dangerous crossing, it could have been the airplane. Well, we prayed, it wasn't the airplane. We knew in our spirits, no, it's not the airplane, what is it? So we get to Finland, we're there for a while and then we board the ferry. Now it's another crossing from Finland to Sweden. That's a crossing. Maybe it's the ferry. Maybe it's the ferry. We don't know everything, but the Holy Spirit does. So we've prayed enough that we are secure in boarding that ferry. The food was fabulous. They had a smorgasbord of food that was just outrageous. And so when our hostess, Hillevi, her name was Hillevi, she's Finnish, she was a, a Finnish judge who went to the same Bible school we did. Now she's going to take us to our chambers on this ship, this big, huge ferry. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe first, hopefully first floor, can we please just see the sky or something? We, it wasn't the first floor. We go down the second floor. I'm thinking, well, surely it will be the second floor. I don't want to go under the water in where I sleep, would you? Maybe it wouldn't bother you, but I didn't like that idea. Wasn't the second floor. Go to the third floor. Now, these nice wide stairways, you know, that have nice wallpaper or whatever it is, everything is f furnished very nicely. Second floor, it's not so good. Third floor, now the 
stairway is getting thin and skimpy and small. I'm not liking this. Metal. Metal stairs. Now you hear the clomping of feet. Then you go to the fourth floor, and I'm thinking, well, surely it's the fourth floor. It wasn't the fourth floor. Now, I'm not liking this at all. Now we go down into the belly of the whale, the belly of this big, this big fish, this big ship that was a ferry. We got cars on board. Now we're on the fifth floor down, and now the stairway is so, so narrow. I can't bear it. I don't know about anybody else. I can't bear it. So we've got four ladies, including our host, Hillary, and she takes us to our stateroom. Well, excuse me, it wasn't a stateroom. It was a little cabin. It was a little teeny cabin. It was a tin box, Pastor Stephanie said. It was not at all anything I could do. I, I, could, I was incapable of staying the night in that little teeny tin box. So we had two bunk boards, uh, bu what are they called? Bunk beds. I think I was on the bottom. And I couldn't handle it. It was more than I could bear. Be, be closed in knowing that you're way under the water. And why did he say dangerous crossing? What was that all about? Did we really pray through on it? Did we turn it? There are things you're going to have to turn. There are things you're going to have to turn. Maybe the call that you're supposed to do, you, can't, you just can't seem to get it together. Well, you're going to have to pray it through until you can. Maybe the person he's told you you're supposed to marry doesn't want to marry you. Well, you're going to have to turn it. Maybe the job he's spoken to you. I can't tell you how many jobs the Lord has created for me that probably weren't even there just because he loved me. And I told him what I wanted. One job I said, well, I want to use my French, and I'm a bookkeeper. I'm a corporate bookkeeper, and this is what I want. And so he created a job out of thin air for me in Vancouver to be a French translator and to be a full-charge bookkeeper. Now, that's what God will do for you. So just because you know it's impossible doesn't mean a hill of beans. You get with the Holy Ghost and you create what's not there. And if whatever it is, the marriage, the business, the calling, you can't do it. Duh. <laughs> we already know that. None of us can do it. So that's when you pray it out. You pray it out, you fully furnish it in the spirit before you try to walk it out. You don't do anything cold in the spirit. Do you know what I mean by that? You don't, God says, you know, like he did with me, move to Tulsa and I move the next day. No, it had to be prayed out. Everything that God tells you that's future, you have to pray it out or you simply cannot walk it out. You'll try and you'll bumble and stumble and you'll get hurt. And then you'll get hurt spiritually and say, see, I'm a failure, or God's word doesn't work, or the Holy Ghost isn't helping me. Well, you didn't do it the way you have to do it. You have to build your future with prayer, with scripture. You declare scripture. And those scriptures that you declare are like axes that go forward. They're like sharp swords that cut apart, cut asunder all the things that are standing in your way. This is your job because you are the one who's been called by God an overcomer. That means you have to overcome every difficulty, every obstacle, because you are called an overcomer. That's your name now. You have to overcome. Holy Ghost will help you. He won't do all the work. He'll do it in conjunction with you by praying and decreeing and declaring and deciding what you want. You have to know what you want, and you have to go as high as you can. What's the point of, you know, wanting some little minuscule thing that you could do in your own strength? Where are the joys in that? Where's the reward in that? No, God's given you something impossible. Now go get it in the spirit first. Don't try to get it in the natural first. 
because you'll break yourself on it. It hasn't been prepared yet. Well, who's going to prepare it? You and the Holy Ghost. You and the Word of God. You and God the Father. Learn this secret. Talk to God incessantly about what you want in your heart. Just talk to God. Just jabber with God all the time what you want in your heart. Never keep quiet. Some things I do not talk to God about out loud because I don't want the devil to hear the plan and then thwart me. Some things I only talk to God about in my own heart of hearts where he can hear me. And he's so gracious about it. He's so gracious about it. I want to tell you a story. I'm not done with Finland. That happened last night to Pastor Stephanie. Do you want to tell it? With Tessie? I'll, t I'll tell it. Pastor Stephanie's dog, Tessie, has had some challenges because she was given three shots at the same time. Parvo, distemper, and rabies. She's 11 years old. And Bordetella. She almost died. She's had to have blood transfusions. Then God spoke to us and said, change your dog food. And so now we're feeding her a holistic diet of human food, some dog food, and she, but the point is she, she has, she got a disease from the three shots, H, what is it called? H-A, I-M-H-A, where her immune system fights her red blood cells and is going to kill her. Her immune system is so revved. So she has to have prednisone. So last night, I'm, do you want to tell it? Can you put this mic on? I would like to urge everybody, don't give your dog all three of those shots at one time. Especially if they're an older dog. Because now I have to forgive my vet. He should have known better. Uh, anyway, so this is how personable Jesus is. He, he's so neat. So I got her pills in my hand. And I, I hate giving them to her. Pregnizone is a really rough drug to give. It, it leaches from calcium from the bones. It's just not a good drug. But it's a good drug if your dog's going to die if she doesn't have it. So it's a good drug, and it's a bad drug. And then there was another drug I had to give her. So I pray about it every time I do. So I was standing there like this. Now, Jesus, here's these drugs. Please take away anything bad anything that would hurt her, because I'm fighting for her life. And she's my little buddy. Please take away everything that would hurt her. And I'm so sincere, and I'm just so right in his face. And just put goodness in it. And so I stopped praying, and then I got up to go around the corner, and I tell you, it was amazing what I saw. Jesus signs to me with beautiful blue light. If it's something really serious or important to me, I see a blue light. And so as I'm getting up. That, that signifies he's heard you. That's six, it's Jesus saying, I got it. I heard you. And I'm with you on this. And so I got up to go around the corner. And I don't know how to describe it to you, but this is how personable and how real Jesus is. He winked at me in blue. I saw, I saw a blue wink. I don't know how to tell you that. Other than he, I saw him wink at me with a blue light, and it's, I hear you. I'm with you on this. It was just amazing. I see blue lights when I say something significant, and it's very important to him or me. But this was a prayer that was very important. Now, how gracious is that? Have you ever heard that Jesus would give you a wink? If I could wink, I'd wink. In blue, to just help you and affirm you and give you peace and comfort? Well, he does, because he did it last night. It's a supernatural sign. Both my twin sister and I have this, that God signs to us in unusual ways like this. So God will tell you the plan, and then he expects you to start praying it out, start declaring it. This is walking in the God kind of faith. You can't get passive. You can't get in self-pity. Well, 
I'm struggling so much with this, that, and the other. You know what? If I say those things to God, the Holy Ghost would kick me in the derriere and say, get going, get your mouth going, get your heart going, get your prayer life going. It's a mountain may be presented before you. So what? You chows that mountain down with your mouth, with your prayer language, with your scriptures, with God's word. You bring it subject to the name of Jesus. Regarding anything, if it's a loved one, you get after it in prayer. Okay, so we're in the ship, the belly of the boat. Oh, just like Jonah. Talk about Jonah. I know I understand Jonah because we were there. It's a cramped room. And I don't, I'm not happy at all. So my sister and I decide we're going to go upstairs. They're playing music and people are dancing. There's a dance hall and they're playing music. Of course, they're drinking too. And we, yeah, it was 50s music. It sounded fun. We're not drinkers. We don't drink at all. But we didn't want to be in that room. So we climbed those stairs. And as we got closer to the top, they got prettier and prettier and wider and wider. And we go up outside of the dance hall because we're not trying to participate in, in that necessarily. We just want to hear the music and not have to go down to the stateroom and go to sleep. Not stateroom, the little tin box and go to sleep. And so we're sitting right outside the door just listening to the music, you know, and really worshiping the Lord. And so these guys from the dance hall start coming out and asking us to go in and dance with them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we would have led them to the Lord, but they didn't speak English and we didn't speak Finnish. So at 3 o'clock, we finally decide, you know what, we better go get some sleep. So we had to go down that hallway and go to that little tinder box. And so I'll never forget it as long as I live. So I'm in the bunk, and all of a sudden, God the Father scoops me up in his arms. This is a supernatural experience. Scoop me, scoops me up in his arms and starts rock buying me and lullabying me. Starts singing and lullabying me, just like you would rock a baby, rock a child, because they're, you know, they're tense, they're upset, they don't like their surroundings or whatever. He rock buys me all night long. Right after that rocking started, with his big arms around me, we heard someone running down the stairs, yelling, screaming, fire, fire, fire. It was a word that sounded like fire. And so I check inside with my heart, my spirit. I'm still being lullabied and rocked by God. And there is no direction or instruction to get up and run whatsoever. Maybe nobody else heard it. You, you heard it. But the other girls were asleep and had been for hours. So we just are so comforted. I'm so comforted in the arms of God. It's just like, wow, I could have lived there forever. It was so comforting. In the morning, we got up, and this is what we discovered. That ferry from Finland to Olin to Sweden was a party ship. And so they drink all the way over. Even the staff drink and get drunk. Everybody drinks and gets drunk all the way over to Sweden. And then they come back the next, I think, on Sunday night. This is Friday night. They come back on Sunday night. They drink all the way back. And then we were told that a few years before this, you may remember this, that same kind of ferry, that exact ferry we were on, the, the hired help, you know, the stewards, were so drunk that they didn't put up the back to the ferry where all the cars are parked. They left the back down, and the whole ferry sunk, and the people were killed. I don't remember if there were any rescued. It made headline news back, back in the day. Do any of you remember reading that? I can remember reading about it. That was the exact kind of ferry we were on, and that's why God said to us ahead of time, dangerous crossing, because it had to be prayed out. It could have been us at the bottom of the sea. But see, you get the plan of God. Is that time to go? 
try to make the plan, you, boy, you're going to, with your strength, your human strength, you're going to make that plan happen? No. If you try to make the plan of God happen, even if it's the perfect will of God for you, by your own strength, it won't work. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to grab hold together with you for your prayer requests, Romans 8, 26, and pray this thing out. You've got to give birth to it. You and the Holy Ghost have to give birth to your own life, marriage, business, healing ministry, whatever it is. You and the Holy Ghost, this is entering into the God kind of faith. You can see it. You can know it 100% sure. But now you and the Holy Spirit have to pray it out. You have to declare it out. And you, too, have to bring it to pass. Do you see this?